to handle any questions that come in over the web. Uh, so those of you who are out on the web, uh, stay tuned, I suppose. Uh, a few housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, those of you who are registered as a student in this class for me uh, under USP 507, I sent out an email about the requirements of written through the university you're taking this for another grade. Uh, so hopefully you got that and you can talk to me later if you need to. I'll send around the sign-in sheet. And uh, in terms of turning in your questions or, or asking the questions, well, in terms of asking questions later on today, I'll try to keep track. And then also, um, if from last week, I'm not sure what happened to your question. Or yeah, two weeks ago when I wasn't here, I'm not sure what happened to your question. Okay, you could email them to me, or if there's other weeks that you're not sure about, Teresa did it three weeks ago. Oh, is that anything? Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, we can just get to me if you think your questions have been straggling or if you want to check with me because I have a sheet that is talking about for the students who are in USB. For later on, when we're asking questions, I need to remind you, as Paul was demonstrating, to hold your finger on the touch button here for the microphone. When the red light is on, you can talk when you're done. And, um, so that way, our webcast can hear and our web version can hear your questions. Yeah, that's uh, what I've uh, from watching the no, just okay. From watching the webcasts a couple weeks ago, you actually have to talk directly into this thing. So having it over here doesn't do you any good. Oh, okay. You have to have it right next to you. Okay. Or it's very hard to hear the questions. Okay. Thank you. Because we do have people who watch this later on the web. So. Okay. I think that's enough. Um, we do we are starting to fill up our lineup for the for winter quarter for the seminar. If you have ideas, uh, please forward them to myself or Rob and then we'll try to get people schedule for the rest of the fall. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Walsh, who's our project manager for Commuter Rail for TriMet. He's been working at TriMet for about 16 years. And he's also a PSU grad. So we're always happy to have our moms come back and speak. And I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about Washington County Commuter Rail. And I think what we're going to do is hold questions until the end. And then remember, in terms of the students, we need to ask questions. Was there, any, you know, I, I think I came there was, and I think we ran out, and I will try to run and get some copies made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that introduction, and good to be back, though it's a little bit different to be here than in the uh, friendly, if somewhat seedy, confines of Francis Manor. That was a great place, but it's a, you know, it's a new era, and uh, this is a great, great facility. Actually, I was, I was back a little earlier than this to work on the early stages of the plaza project and the streetcar. Uh, getting the permitting done and environmental work done and that sort of thing. So it, it feels nice to, to stay in touch a little bit. So today, what I, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, not having a chance to talk to the instructors about who exactly you all are and what your interests and tracks are, what I chose to do was to bring you a broad overview of the project, really the soup to nuts, a uh, couple, of, couple of reasons. Uh, to be able to talk interesting to me now as a, as a project manager, and I, and I joke to my engineering and construction friends, a recovering planner. Uh, I take it one day at a time, and maybe I shouldn't be here. It may be too great a temptation. But uh, to, give, to try and set the planning work in some larger context of how, does, how do we get from an idea to revenue service? Uh, so probably uh, you find that the short change, the planning role, a little bit, uh, partly because it wasn't work that I was involved in directly. We'll talk a little bit about that, but Washington County and Metro did that work, then uh, TriMet has taken the project over, but also, on, and really more importantly, to, to be able to give uh, a group of graduate planning students a sense of where, where the planning part fits in the, in the life cycle of a project. So I'm curious how many of you are uh, concentrating in the transportation area in your work? So really the great majority, and currently working in, a, in an agency or a, on research, a research project or uh, okay, so a number of you are 
seeing it uh, somewhat from both sides. Just engineers and planners in here. Okay, that was my next question: was who's who's an engineer, and the rest uh, will then conclude our planners. All right, now I got to figure out the technology here. Let's see. Yes. yes. All right. So, I will just uh, try and walk through at a pretty brisk pace that whole idea of the life cycle of the project, starting with plan planning and evaluation, some of the design, the agreements that have to be reached between, in this case, a whole host of parties with very interesting and different interests and. Uh, uh, varying degrees of power that they bring to the negotiating table, talk about where we are with funding uh, and our construction status, and then just very briefly uh, what happens in, the, in that startup phase. First, though, just to get, the, get us all on the ground floor here, probably everybody very well aware of this, but talk about the kind of three schools of rail transit, and there's lots of crossover and nothing is pure. We all know that, but just briefly, of course, uh, light rail, which we have here with uh, overhead power and uh, usually two or three car trains. Some people have four car trains. I think they run some of those in Denver. It's a, it, it's a long day, but uh, you know, basically the, the business day plus, and it operates in urban and suburban settings. Heavy rail or subway, uh, you wouldn't say that in Chicago because it's elevated, but anyway, uh, Third rail electric, big long trains, uh, six and even more cars and a train, long service day, some more than 20 hours, and it's a, usually a heavy urban <coughs> setting. Then we come to commuter rail, which is uh, we have not seen, of course, in the Portland region before. Uh, some of the older systems are electric powered. Uh, most of the New York system, the Chicago part of the Chicago system, electric powered. Mostly, though, by predominantly pulled by diesel locomotives uh, with a string of one or two level cars, passenger cars. You know, more traditional railroad service, typically only peak hour service, and uh, suburban, sub I should say suburban to CBD. So get those definitions out of the way. Though, what, what I, one of the things I want to talk about is how this project doesn't neatly uh, fit into the commuter rail uh, column exactly. <coughs> Uh, very briefly, and again, I apologize for, for giving a little bit of short shrift to the, on the planning side uh, to this. But the background was in, back in 97, Washington County and the, some of the cities of Washington County, uh, Sherwood, Tiger Twalton, Beaverton, I believe, did a very preliminary feasibility study looking for fatal flaws. Can, is there any reason why commuter rail couldn't work? in this corridor. They were satisfied, uh, the answer there, took it to the next, uh, what's called the phase two study. In the phase two study, they looked much more closely uh, issues of railroad ownership, arrangements uh, that would have to be made, costs, pre preliminary costs, preliminary structure of the service, when, where, how long, and basically rounded up the big issues that they would have to face if they went forward. And basically that set a work program out for the next phase, which was the, uh, is basically the transportation planning, environmental planning, now, as you're probably well aware, mostly wrapped into the NEPA process. In this case, they did an environmental assessment rather than an environmental impact study, which has some, uh, it's a smaller scale document, but because it was adding service to an existing rail line, uh, the agreement that an environmental assessment was uh, appropriate document, appropriate uh, level of effort, if you will. That document, of course, looks at an array of impacts, environmental, social, uh, transportation, across the board. I'm sure you've all uh, been through an EIS or two and know what's in there. And that wrapped into that process is the ridership forecasting process run by Metro, which is a, a separate standalone project process for any, uh, it's a requirement, it's a, it's a fairly, very specified, uh, fairly rigorous process 
required for all major transportation investments. Who here has been through either work, uh, project work or class work with the ridership modeling process? So it is uh, not my forte to say the least and it's, it is something that we're having some very interesting discussions with the feds about. I'll talk just a little bit about those in a minute. So the boy, a, a quick summary of the of the modeling process, if I could, which is fundamentally the same as when uh, I looked at this in the classroom, and I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but uh, essentially it is using very thorough demographic data about specific to the Portland region about household income, employment, travel patterns. Uh, then creates this enormous uh, spreadsheet of productions and attractions of the trips in the region and in the study area and goes through uh, essentially an impedance process using certain assumptions to assign those trips to the, to the, the most natural uh, route, uh, auto or transit, and then between auto and transit, which, which route. And the model that Metro has developed is more sensitive, more complex than I think just about any in the country and is, is very well regarded in, in transportation modeling settings. So in this case they constructed two alternatives, the build which is the commuter rail alternative and a TSM, transportation systems management, which involved adding some express bus service and making some changes to the uh, the streets that the buses travel on to allow for some transit priority measures. And that occurred in the corridor. It's not a region-wide uh, TSM network, but in the corridor, which was defined uh, as basically Wilsonville to Beaverton. So the result of that is that in the model year, there's just under 5,000 new riders. Half have switched from buses and half are new to transit. Another key part of the planning process and one that is gaining increasing uh, stature in the federal process, Federal Transit Administration recognizes what an area has or doesn't have, is doing, isn't doing in the land use realm as a key contributor to the success and the cost effectiveness of a transit program. And I just want to give you the very kind of the high view of this. It's been uh, probably our, our binder on, of data on the land use front is probably a, uh, four inches or more that we submitted to the FTA. But on the, the challenging side, we've got in this corridor, a lot of the land is devoted to industrial. There are a lot of parks and floodplains. If you're familiar with that area, say from uh, south part of Tigard on into Wilsonville, heavily industrial, number of regional and local parks, Walton River, Fano Creek, floodplains. Um, and another challenge is the pedestrian environment. We'll talk a little bit about this, but one of the reasons this alternative is, is interesting and viable is because of the lack of a basic grid system that, to develop in the corridor area. That's driven a lot by, ge by geography and driven a lot by the historic pattern of urbanization, of, of a quick urbanization from farmland and forest uh, to, to urban. Uh, that's not, we have a very differing pedestrian environments as you go from station to station. Uh, just briefly, uh, Beaverton, a tremendous amount of work and investment and blood, sweat, and tears uh, being shed in Beaverton to recreate downtown Beaverton with a more pedestrian friendly environment. Next stop, is Washington Square at Shoals Ferry, probably our toughest challenge in creating a pedestrian environment. Very close, an easy walk to a couple of the big, big business parks down there, uh, but a, a <coughs> excuse me, a tough hike uh, to get across 217 to Washington Square itself. But I think those are outweighed by the opportunities that, from a land use standpoint, uh, with each of the jurisdictions increasing density in the station areas. A good example is Tualatin, 
uh, where they're doing a tremendous amount of urban renewal and planning and zoning for density within the within their downtown and right adjacent to the commuter rail station. And of course, what's driving the fundamental problem, which is mobility uh, that we're trying to solve, what's driving that problem is a combination of the lack of uh, existing infrastructure and the phenomenal growth that this part of Washington County and the, the whole Highway 26 corridor uh, has experienced. And just I'm just I'm going to say from memory that if you look at job growth in the eastern Washington County, the 26, U.S. 26 corridor, it's 50 to 100 percent of what the regional average has been uh, over the last 15 years. And what's happened since uh, 95, 96 are the last numbers that I've seen. Uh, probably leveled off, not probably, has leveled off uh, in the last year, but that's probably a temporary condition. So we've got a corridor with uh, tremendous job growth and obviously population growth as well. Okay, so those are, that's just kind of a, uh, a snapshot on the, the planning side. There's another piece of the planning uh, that, that I want to just highlight or, or footnote, I guess. As transportation planners, we're not, we're not brought into this too much, but as we go forward, we'll have a whole other planning process uh, as we go through the regulatory hoops. So we have uh, design review and land use permitting process in uh, Beaverton, Tiger, Tualatin, and Wilsonville. Each one of those, uh, pretty rigorous, uh, and I don't know if any, is anybody here involved in any of that uh, kind of work, either in, in their class or out of uh, at work. So that's a it comes later in the process, but it, it, there's a tie from the planning side, uh, transportation planning side, uh, in terms of sizing your facilities, being able to bring to a planning commission or a council the uh, fundamental need and for the project, the sizing of the project, not just the facilities, but the, the stations, but the, the capacity as well. Another side of that is the on the regulatory uh, natural resources primarily. So we'll have a very significant permitting process to go through with the Corps of Engineers and Division of State Lands uh, because we do impact some wetlands, not much, but uh, even a little uh, is significant. Clean Water Services, which used to be United Sewerage Agency, has a very, also a very rigorous permitting process based on riparian resources and stream resources. and. Uh, when we look at the map, we see, or if you're familiar with that area, you know that uh, we cross and recross uh, Ash Creek, Fano Creek, uh, Tigard River, I mean, Tualatin River. So just a, a little sidebar on the planning piece. Okay, then I'm going to switch, shift gears into the design and the first part, which we have completed, preliminary design, usually goes forward in concert with the NEPA process. So uh, especially on a smaller project, on, on a big project, uh, West Side Light Rail, the environmental work was substantially complete before even uh, the preliminary design began. But on these smaller projects, and especially when you're in the environmental assessment rather than the EIS mode, uh, you do try and, and move them somewhat in parallel. So uh, it's for the, the engineers in the group, this is the point where you're still uh, designing it with a pretty broad brush. You should have all of your, your systems ish identified. You should have your key dimensions uh, fitted. Uh, but you certainly won't have exact dimensioning of, of the features. You won't have done an exhaustive survey. Preliminary design was done with aerial photo work here. So that's our next stop on, in the design process, actually, is to run uh, the actual survey from which to build the final design. Uh, you, should, you have created a preliminary cost, and that's most likely going to be uh, the cost that you're going to live with, uh, live with and die with uh, at this stage would be contingency included. Uh, but again, that's why you need to have the big and even the medium issues identified. Your, your PE has to be pretty thorough. Uh, 
uh, from a permitting standpoint, because you're going to, this is going to, PE is going to be the basis of a lot of your permit work and cost estimate work. And uh, simply for a matter of going forward, representing your project to whatever audience, be it uh, the county commission, the state legislature, or the feds, uh, I think we've seen examples uh, elsewhere. Uh, maybe somebody in the room can talk to us about Seattle. Uh, Uh, where, whether that that for no no particular fault, but that dilemma of how you go forward uh, with a to get your project approvals, it's it's very tough to know how far to go to nail down the scope of the project and the costs. Report those back because you don't want to go all the way, do all the design, do all the costing, find that people have different ideas, they want to move the alignment over here, uh, they want a different, a different kind of a station, a station in a different place. So just uh, one, of the, one of the dilemmas of the trade. Of course, final design is from an engineering standpoint where it gets real and it gets interesting, uh, where everything has to fit. You have your construction plans and specifications ready to hand to the builder. Uh, complete and to the extent that they aren't complete you certainly leave yourself wide open for extra costs uh, that's a that gets to be a tough game in the contracting arena so how complete your plans are and the ability of a of a contractor who's so inclined uh, to find holes in them and come back with extra costs and at this point you've got the probably one of the products of the final design is your final cost estimate uh, and this is this is a, it's an engineer's estimate, and should uh, you should be able to take a little bit of your contingency and apply to some areas in this uh, final engineer's estimate. But uh, this should match your final budget. If not, of course you've got uh, the fun has just begun. Okay, so that's uh, just a small window into the in a generic sort of way. Design issues and, and the design challenges on this project, very interesting for a transit agency that's used to building light rail in an urban setting. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but we are going into a freight railroad environment. And this is a technology of uh, not last century, but the century before that. So this is a 19th century technology uh, that has changed, fundamentally changed very little uh, in the last more than 100 years. And it's in a primarily, it's not primarily, it is exclusively in its own right of way, except where it, uh, in, for less than half a mile in Beaverton, and where it crosses the major roads. So the tolerances, uh, the tolerances in the freight rail industry and the tolerances in that kind of a uh, non close in urban setting are considerably less. Uh, so that's going to be a challenge for our engineers to. To really dial back a little bit uh, some of the design and some of the scope in terms of signaling and communications, uh, it is a decidedly a lower tech environment. All right. Moving on to uh, the sort of the next big hump once you've got agreement on what it is. Uh, and how much it's going to cost. Uh, then you go through the process of making it real through a series of agreements with uh, all the parties, and we'll talk a little bit in just a minute about uh, the wide range of those that we're facing here. From a funding standpoint, you should have it, you need to have it pretty well all tied down at this point, but if it's not in place, you are, you are, you're simply not going forward. Uh, beyond that point. And then uh, finally, the, the part that tends to get forgotten on the, on the planning and design part is the, is the actual construction, uh, which is where projects like this, where the money uh, goes, obviously. Agreements uh, on any project that involves a number of jurisdictions, be it uh, TriMet in the city of Portland to build the plaza and the uh, sidewalks here, uh, basically a, a contract, a business deal, 
it's because it's between two governments, it has a little bit different form, and the enforceability is more is much more on people's uh, good intentions and good work because the thought of two jur government jurisdictions going to court to enforce the provisions of one of these agreements seldom happens, and, and you don't want it to happen. But just uh, just a little flavor of the agreements that have to be put together on this project. We've just finished the TriMet to and Washington County agreement, which essentially hands the project over to TriMet. Washington County did all the preliminary, everything that we've talked to up to this point was done by Washington County uh, because TriMet is used to designing and building rail systems and because we're used to operating a rail system, county decided rather than try and figure out something different, uh, it would be just best to, to hand this over to TriMet at this point. An interesting one that we're just uh, starting the final serious discussions with is TriMet and Wilsonville. Some of you may remember that Wilsonville withdrew from the TriMet district. Uh, the city of Wilsonville is its own transit district. So by law, uh, to operate in each other's district, we have to have one of these agreements. We're also asking Wilsonville to assist with the funding. So there, and the project terminates. So there's a station, a park and ride, and a maintenance facility that we would build in another transit district. Uh, so uh, the cities in Washington County have done a fairly comprehensive agreement on permitting, essentially each binding the other to a, a standard of reasonableness uh, uh, on the, the kind of extras that might be requested through the land use process. So everybody says, we've seen the preliminary designs, we accept the preliminary designs, and features that aren't absolutely required by the project that go beyond that, we will fund ourselves if possible, or we won't do them. Uh, Washington County has a contract with ODOT for local funding. I'll we'll go through the numbers in a minute, but uh, that, those are the key ones on the government side. The 800-pound gorilla in all of that has been the shared use agreement with the railroad. Washington County uh, has spent the last three years working with Portland and Western, which is the short line railroad that controls this territory that the project would occur in. And uh, there are many, many tales out there, battle scarred veterans, of what it's like to work with the railroad. Portland and Western has been a good, pretty good partner, but still, uh, three years and a lot of scar tissue, um, that agreement is complete. A purchase agreement with Union Pacific, who owns part of the uh, corridor, is nearly complete. Then we'll have, where this is all leading is a grant agreement with the feds, uh, where all the provisions and all the conditions that occur in all these other agreements and the designs are all wrapped in. We promise the feds to produce a project in, that looks like our plans under the terms of all the agreements that we've made with everybody, following all the federal rules and regulations for a not to exceed price. So that's, that is the next big hurdle that we face. And that's, that's just on the agreement side. Uh, funding, I'll talk a little bit more about how it's the, the split in a minute. And then uh, finally, construction. I think we're probably out of time, won't be able to talk too much about construction. Uh, again, this is just a review of uh, how our project stacks up against some of these other projects across the country. Of course, everybody's uh, mental image of commuter rail probably is the family sedan going to the park and ride at the one of the far suburbs of the big city. and. Uh, uh, fellow in the snap brim hat and a narrow tie and a briefcase uh, climbs on the train to the, go to work at his law firm or ad agency. Uh, there, there are a number of upstart lines, though, primarily uh, almost all Sunbelt, uh, Florida, California, Texas, that are still mostly central business district oriented. A uh, very interesting one is down in Dallas, which we think of as the uh, bastion of the single family automobile, but this, the single occupant automobile, their system runs between Dallas and Fort Worth and has been tremendously successful uh, beyond, really beyond their, their best expectations. San Diego uh, has the coaster route 
success, very successful. Metrolink uh, running the pretty much the length of the LA basin. At least I don't know how far north it goes, but south uh, all the way to I believe Ontario. Uh, in the northwest, we've got a good example in Seattle. Their sounder system. When it finally runs from south of Tacoma to Everett will be, Lana, do you know the mileage? That's phenomenal. That's got to be 50, 60 miles. Uh, these, almost all, the, all these services, with the exception of some of the trains in Dallas, are modern locomotive with bi-level cars. So if you've seen the sounder cars on your way up to Seattle, uh, that, those are pretty much the last word in luxury. It's, and it's... Fundamental technology isn't the same, but some of the amenities, no, the amenities are greatly increased and the ride is much improved through the way the track is, is designed and constructed and the suspension in the cars. Okay, our project, however, is not, uh, not the typical park and ride. It's shorter than average. It's just under 15 miles. It feeds into the MAC system rather than the CBD. Uh, we are looking at less than half of our riders coming from park and ride. And, and I don't think anybody's really ready to make any great pronouncements on this, but I would just sort of suggest that it, that it is a kind of a hybrid between commuter rail and light rail. It's an extension, a kind of an extension of the light rail system, the MAX system from Beaverton down south. Uh, takes advantage of this freight corridor because we're operating in an active freight corridor, it then has a lot of the attributes of commuter rail, it has, and it is uh, will be operating at uh, peak hours with a with a pretty wide headway. Okay, time to get to the good stuff. You've been very patient. So, what and where? Uh, well, is it 14.6 or 14.7? I better get the tape out and figure that out. Uh, again, runs from Beaverton to Wilsonville. 30-minute headways in the peak hour. We have, we already have built into the railroad agreement the provision for noontime service, uh, but the plan right now is just to open with this uh, AM and PM peak service, and uh, this shared use aspect is critical to a lot of the design, the agreements, some of the operating costs, the vehicle. That drives a lot of things that we do. Five stations, Wilsonville, Tualatin, Tigard, Washington Square, and Beaverton. All of those but Beaverton have some amount of park and ride. We range from 400 in Wilsonville, 200 at Washington Square, Tigard and Tualatin are each about 100. Again, I mentioned the, the ridership aspect, the freight service. We'll talk a little bit more about the role of the railroad. And uh, Are people familiar with that term, short line? Right, it's a, it's a, uh, it's like a. If you're a baseball fan, it's a single A or or a double A uh, farm. It's the farm team. When, when the big railroads started divesting themselves of a lot of their outlying routes, uh, entrepreneurial local entrepreneurs bought them up and uh, started putting together some uh, basically local pickup and delivery service. This is the subject of a whole separate seminar, but the. Working in this freight rail environment, obviously they have 150 plus years of legal and political clout uh, in terms of being able to call the shots. Interestingly enough, if you look at that, a lot of the legal basis of that was set in a couple of cases that were presented by a hotshot railroad attorney back in the 1850s named Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and I sometimes think we're still back in that era in terms of some of the practices. We have a uh, partner in the Federal Railroad Administration who is, has a very, very heavy hand um, regulation. Uh, they regulate virtually every aspect of railroad operation, going back to the time when the annual death toll from uh, railroad disasters was, I'm sure, in the hundreds. And it won't affect us that much, but there is this just tremendous crazy quilt of employment laws in terms of the railroad being subject to different programs for workers' comp, for retirement, for unemployment, 
the safety related aspects of the job, time of service. Uh, so with that in mind, who are the railroads? That, what's at play here? So the, we, down in the southern eight plus miles, we have an interesting situation where ODOT earn, owns the dirt on the bridges, uh, but Portland and Western owns the track and the signals and the one thing that really counts for anything, the freight rights. Uh, that's, the, that's the goose right there that lays the golden eggs and gives them a tremendous amount of say-so in virtually anything you do. Just north of Tigard will be on alignment that's now owned lock, stock, and barrel by Union Pacific. They're not actively operating there. Portland and Western, the short line, operates out there. So that drives uh, some of these agreements. We have county completed its shared use agreement with Portland and Western. Priority for passenger trains in the, in the passenger service window. Agreed on what the, the track and signal improvements will be. Uh, established as a, a requirement for liability insurance, which is very significant in this uh, post 9-11 period. Uh, insurance industry is just all over the map. It establishes that the railroad will take care of the track maintenance, will dispatch the trains from their headquarters down in Albany, so not from light rail headquarters in Gresham, so this will be on a, on a whole different uh, system. And their personnel will operate the trains, will actually drive the trains. Talked about these employment requirements. Uh, even if the railroad were willing, uh, the crossover from a TriMet environment to a railroad environment just doesn't work. Uh, you have a federal uh, locomotive engineer license that has all kinds of training and maintenance requirements to keep it. Uh, so uh, that's, it just operates, the operating personnel come from a whole different environment. Well, I'll talk a little bit about some of those agreements. Uh, where are we now? We are in this process with the Federal Transit Administration where they take all the requests from uh, San Jose and Peoria and Portland and Seattle and Sioux Falls and put them all in a hopper and, and rank them. That goes to, they need that to give us the final design approval. They send that list over to Congress then in creating the, the spending bills that which of these projects will be funded and which won't. And we're getting, uh, having some very, I guess, vigorous discussions with the planners at FTA headquarters in D.C. Uh, because, I think, of this hybrid nature of this project there, uh, a couple of the people use the commuter rail, Virginia Rail Express, uh, and they say, gee, my, my line is 35 miles long, three trips a day. Uh, it gets this ridership. How come you have so many trips? How come your line's so short? Uh, so we're really going through a pretty rigorous exercise with them in bringing the modeling, going through the metro modeling process. And again, we have a real, uh, that, that model is a real stalwart. It's, it really is one of the best in the country. Uh, I need to move along here, I guess. What exactly are we, what is this capital program? Well, we're going to put a half a mile of new track in Beaverton and if you're familiar with Beaverton, we're going from Farmington to the Beaverton Transit Center. We're going to go on the surface uh, down Lombard Street. Uh, so we'll have a, the, a single track running in the median in Lombard for just under half a mile. We're going to upgrade the existing track. Uh, we'll have double track all the way from Beaverton to Tigard and a passing siding down in Tualatin. We'll bring passenger rail will require a new signal system because there basically is not a signal system on the railroad today. Uh, simply a, uh, a phone and uh, Charlie from dispatch calls the engineer and says, all right, you've got the track from Tiger to, to Beaverton on. Nobody else is coming on. With passengers, we have to have a new, uh, more advanced signal system. A small maintenance facility down in Wilsonville and eight vehicles. Cost for design, construction, administration, vehicles, everything, 120 million. Uh, the request is 48 local, 72 federal, 60-40. That is 
somewhat going against the grain of the administration's request that all these projects come in at 50-50 uh, federal funding, uh, but our project went in the hopper before that uh, push came forward. So we'll see how that plays out. Okay, talked about that. This is, uh, again, just a, a not very inspiring picture of how we would operate in Beaverton on the street. Stations are going to be more stripped down than you would see on Max, and that's pretty typical for uh, commuter rail. Uh, they just they they don't get as much use by as many people for as long a period, and they are simpler. But you'll you'll recognize them as a, a Portland Region Transit station. One of the design challenges we have is the ADA access because the rail cars have a floor 51 inches, so there's not there is no such thing as a low floor railroad car. They all have their floors at 51 inches. So we're working with our uh, Citizens for Accessible Transportation CAP committee to figure out a good ADA system uh, to make sure that the commitment that exists today to uh, basically easy quality, easy boarding and quality seating for anybody in a mobility device we meet here. A very interesting uh, avenue for us, the commuter rail vehicles. Because we're in the railroad environment, we have to use railroad cars, railroad safety rated. And the standard in railroad is, is from a safety standpoint, is something like a 50 mile an hour head-on collision. So these things are absolutely tanks. We are, and DMU is a bit of jargon for diesel multiple unit. That is a self-propelled car as opposed to the locomotive hauling a string of cars. And this harkens back to uh, uh, something that was very popular probably 50 years ago. It's for lighter, lighter passenger loads, longer distances, this self-propelled car. You can hook uh, two or three of them together. There is one out there. Dallas uses them, very happy with them from the 1950s, the, made by the Bud Company, the rail diesel car. And we may be interested in using those for a period of time. There isn't a currently available on the market safety certified diesel multiple unit. So on the Oregonian or in the Valley Times two weeks ago, Colorado rail car was here with a prototype. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that. But this is the vintage car that's in use uh, down in Dallas. Uh, the few, few available mini in poor shape is probably out of date uh, because there are 13 in Dallas and they are in uh, absolutely sparkling condition. Our folks don't like the transmissions, but uh, that's something that can be can be fixed. Next option is to go to established car builders, and that's uh, a Siemens or a Bombardier who have built the light rail vehicles, the two generations of light rail vehicles in Portland. Uh, they and they this is probably overstates the problem a little bit. Uh, Bombardier de very definitely does have a car a des car design. Uh, it's an Shown here, this is an adaptation of an electric uh, powered commuter car that they would use. And then the other interesting thing is this Colorado rail car has a prototype. They're taking it around the country. Uh, they have worked closely with the Federal Railroad Administration and the other regulators in developing this car. Uh, they are very entrepreneurial, uh, very tough and energetic, and they market the heck out of this thing. So. Uh, county had them out here. TriMet uh, kind of took a back seat on that visit, but a uh, number of us have visited this car. It looks very promising, uh, and it is all these diesel cars are powered by a couple of uh, 600 horse diesel engines and a big uh, automatic transmission. Bombardier may be uh, diesel electric, but uh, most of the things that are being looked at are strictly diesel powered. So from a maintenance standpoint, they're considerably simpler. Okay, we had hoped to be in final design uh, last month, but because of these discussions with the feds about the, the model, the ridership, the, the whole concept of this line, uh, we're being delayed. So we expect next month that we'll drop the flag and, and start the final design work. We would hope to have the full funding grant agreement in place uh, late spring, 
start some of the construction next fall. Things like uh, the bridges that we'll be replacing along the line are a number of them are in sensitive fish habitats, so we have to be in the low water period, what's called the fish window. So that's what we'd like to get uh, underway next summer. And then we expect to late 05, early 06, and probably the critical path item here is the manufacture and the testing of the vehicles. Uh, we can get all of this capital work uh, knocked out pretty quick. But to get this new vehicle approved and manufactured, uh, we'll stretch, stretch our timeline out. Uh, we could certainly open earlier if we decided to use one of the existing cars out of Dallas. The operating cost, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. It certainly has a high, high entry cost. Uh, you can certainly lower your, your costs by adding service, but we start with a pretty modest level of service and high fixed costs. That results then in, a, in what is, to us from the light rail environment, a pretty high per rider cost, and that is a concern. But we've looked at, at these costs across the board with regard to other commuter rail lines, and we're well, uh, we're well within the pack in terms of those costs. What we find is that the contracting it out versus running uh, using TriMet uh, to do TriMet forces, uh, unionized TriMet forces to do the work in this freight environment and uh, the railroad environment. It's even though Portland Western is non-union, it's very much market-driven uh, and a lot of high fixed costs. Uh, insurance, maintenance, those sorts of things. And we are both TriMet and Wilsonville are cognizant of the fact that we will need to rearrange our bus service, uh, possibly add some. We haven't, we don't think much. And a uh, question that's been raised: Will there be need to be some additional LRT service to Beaverton to absorb the ridership? So if uh, 100 people get off a commuter rail train for the couple of the peak of the peak trips, uh, we've already got high capacity, out, high level of uh, ridership out in Beaverton. So we're probably going to need to look at some service adjustments to create additional max capacity going both east and west, interestingly enough, because a fairly small, I should have mentioned earlier, really a very modest part of the ridership, uh, 25, 30 percent, actually ends up coming downtown. Folks are taking short hops on the commuter line. They are going out to jobs in Hillsboro, the 26th corridor. Uh, it has a very strong bi-directional focus. That's also different than most commuter rail. Okay, so I've talked way too long. I apologize. Just the, the things to think about. This is a cutting-edge project in a number of regards. Uh, this we will be, we'll be the first to use this new type of vehicle. Uh, we have taken a different approach to using the uh, short line railroad, uh, then brought them in more. Uh, it's a little bit more of a partnership with the railroad rather than, a, than what some places have done, which is to attempt a, what I can crudely call a cram down with the railroads and not have it succeed. Uh, the county's approach was to work, try and work constructively with the railroad from the beginning. Uh, so they have a big stake in it. The way our deal is structured, uh, their financial success is dependent on the success of the service. So if they don't provide quality service, basically they make no profit. Of course, we come in an environment just like uh, it's, it's no different in transit than anything else. Uh, tough times in terms of the on the federal front because of other priorities, because uh, like I say, the Phoenixes and the Peorias and Sioux Falls, everybody uh, is in the hopper now. Uh, so lower, fewer resources, more projects in, uh, so that we've got to be very competitive. What we have going, though, I think in the final analysis is uh, really strong support from Washington County, from the cities of Washington County, who have uh, driven this thing from the beginning. We really, TriMet, like I say, really only came in uh, as a very serious player. We participated technically, but in a leadership role, really less than a year that we've been participating. Uh, so, and that was one of the considerations was the strong, strong support that this has from the chambers and the city councils and the uh, West Side Economic Alliance across the board. Anyway, I should 
stop there. Uh, how do you want to go? Uh, I'll start with a, an easy, easy question. Uh, are you related in any way to former TriMet manager Tom Walsh? <laughs> uh, for better or worse, I'm not. We we traced it back a ways, at least in recorded time. We don't think so. Web. A couple email questions. It gets really close. <laughs> Will the Washington County focus additional efforts on feeding bike traffic into park and ride lots and other stations so as to minimize the need to use auto or transfer from buses, similar to the strong Dutch and Japanese commuter train models? Uh, you know, I don't, I, they should. I expect they will. Uh, we know that each of the jurisdictions is doing more bike planning. Uh, and look at the street projects. As we look at street projects adjacent to the commuter rail line, Tualatin has got an improvement project on the two streets where, the cross streets where our project is located, Tualatin Sherwood and Lower Boones, both have bike routes. Certainly have bike racks and bike lockers at the station. In terms of the configuration of the car, don't know how exactly it'll work, but I think we can guess that there will be bike storage. Uh, you'll be able to bring your bike on the train. Uh, second is uh is TriMet considering non-traditional amenities found on many of the older commuter lines, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, such as uh, privately financed rented train cars that serve drinks and food among regular riders? This type of service might draw more choice riders into the TriMet system. Those sort of things have been talked about for this line. Probably we wouldn't get involved in them. Uh, the railroad, interestingly enough, uh, laid in the game reserved for themselves the right to operate excursion trains, uh, that sort of thing. So I think they see an opportunity there. Uh, but the, this trip is fairly short. This is less than 30 minutes, and we have a lot of turnover, uh, a lot of shorter trips. So probably not on the commuter. What is the total right of way width of the corridor? Do you know? It varies. Uh, some areas, uh, I'm going to say it's as wide as 150 feet. So in Tigard and Tualatin, we'll be able to, and that's where there's uh, overlap in the track. Two tracks used to run parallel, two separate rail lines. The Oregon Electric and the Southern Pacific ran parallel for a portion. So there, we're able to do our double track light, uh, commuter rail right of way and a three or four bay park and ride, long narrow park and ride. Uh, but for the most part, it's uh, 40 feet. Um, I was just I was just interested that you said that Pacific and Western um, agreed to give priority to passenger. Um, travel to the passenger trains in the peak hour. And I guess I have a right. two-part question. Um, what's considered the peak? And then second of all, um, how busy are is the freight movement on those tracks and what were some of the strategies, I guess, that you got used to make them agree to that? Sure. Uh, first question, what's the peak? Uh, I think it's 5.30 to 9.30 and 3 to 7. And their current use, uh, they are running about between five and seven trains a day. Some of them, you know, they, are, they run five trains every day. And depending on the traffic, how many cars they have to pick up or deliver. Uh, as far, boy, and as far as the strategy that the, the county used, I think it was a tough negotiation, and, it, and they used everything they had, including the kitchen sink. I think in the final analysis, there are two things that, that really worked. First of all, to show Portland and Western and their parent company, they are owned uh, by a holding company 
in on the East Coast, Genesee and Wyoming, uh, has a, a probably seven or eight short line railroads in this country and railroad interests around the world. Showed them that there is a potential for profit for them in this without interfering with their desire to grow the freight business. And that's the, that is really a key. Uh, my first instinct, and I think everybody's first instinct in looking at this and the hard work you have to do with the railroads, buy them out. Well, two, two problems. One, that's going to be a very expensive proposition. Second, we're trying to do a number of things with transportation in this region and, and around the country, and one of those is to be smart about freight. And we want to make sure that if we can move freight on existing railroads where the investment exists uh, and they don't take up space on the highways, that's a plus. So that's why we didn't want to buy them out. The second, I think, really, though, uh, maybe not quite as important as the, as the profit, is that these folks are actually fairly tied to the community. Uh, so they want to, uh, I mean, it's doing the right thing is, a, is probably overstating it or a cliche. But I think in the final analysis, that might have been a, something that pushed them over the edge. So they're, they're a company, Genesee in Wyoming, has ties to Oregon. The, the CEO, I think, you know, ultimately might have been a tiebreaker to say yes. Uh, and I think also the fact that the county did not try the cram down approach that they were genuine and respectful and tough negotiators. Uh, very quick. Where is their profit coming from? Is it from operating the trains? Yes, and their profit comes from they are reimbursed at cost for the activities they undertake. Their profit on that comes based on their on-time record. So that if they, if they get 100%, if they get a uh, 90% on-time record, I think there is basically no fee, no bonus. And if they get 100%, uh, it's basically consistent with what a, you know, a, a decent market profit would be for the activities and the risks that they're undertaking. You want this in one long question or a series of short uh, questions? Try the one long one. My memory's not that okay, good. Okay. Uh, uh, on the uh, trains uh, that'll go on during the peak hours, about four hours, uh, how many seats per train? And uh, will you charge a fare? Uh, Smart now doesn't charge any fares. Will Wilson Joe stay out of the TriMet uh, uh, payroll tax uh, zone uh, as they are now uh, uh, since they're in there? And uh, do you have a copy of the model uh, uh, that you've used uh, 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 for uh, computing your ridership that I can get hold of? Because I've used the, uh, um, uh, the census, uh, TAZ, origin destination information, and I can't come up anywhere close to your projections. Okay, let me try if I get this right. Uh, great, if not, just remind me. Uh, Roughly 100 seats per car, so two-car train, 200 seats. Uh, capacity is somewhat above that, but I think in, in this environment, the, the model is more toward, the, the business model is more towards a, a full seated load rather than the, the standing load, but uh, two, approximately 200 seats per two-car train. Uh, Wilsonville, uh, it's not coming back into the TriMet district. I think that was one of the questions. Uh, yes, we do charge a fare, but it'll be not a premium fare. Uh, for instance, if you were in the Chicago area, uh, south side, and you wanted to go to uh, the eight miles to downtown, you could take a bus for a buck ten or a buck and a quarter. You could take the L for about the same, or you could take the commuter rail for about five bucks. So we won't have a, a split tier system like that. It'll be based on the existing fare system. How, what's the fare from Wilsonville to Beaverton? I don't know. Free At both the TriMet and Smart sides, free transfers. And I'm, fortunately for all of us, I'm not the modeler. I've got the uh, forecast report that I can give you. That'd be a, a starting place, and then I'd have to have you 
talk to the gurus at Metro because you'd, you'd be talking over my head. Uh, John Cullerton or uh, Rich Parker? He kind of touched upon my question. I had wondered what the fares would be. And I was just looking at your operating costs, and bear with me. I'm, I'm taking an economics class in transportation, so I'm going to try it out I'm on sorry. you, if that's okay. Yeah. It'll be over soon. <laughs> yeah, soon. Anyway, um, so if you have operating costs of $4 million a year and you have ridership initially at 2400 a day, I did some calculations, and it looks like it's going to cost about six dollars a person for the fare. Is that anywhere near? Well, what no. I mean, this, the the fare will be the stand. You know, is it from what's our standard three zone fare? Buck fifty, buck fifty five. Uh, so that will be the fare. So the degree, it's what's the uh, fare box recovery? Is I think is what you're asking. Yeah. Um, and I think it's around around 20 percent, so not as good as uh, Max system, similar to a lot of our kind of average performing bus routes. But I, I mean, I, I want to if we want to follow up on that, we can because I want to be real precise. I'm just sort of top of top of the head here. So. So would TriMet be picking up the rest of the cost? We we'll have we have an agreement. Uh, Washington County and Wilsonville will share in the operating costs. So Fairbox, TriMet, County, Wilsonville, all those go into the to the mix. Thank you. I got a, a three part. Oh. Man, you guys are <laughs> but it's quick. Me. Uh, first of all, is the uh, Colorado car that was on display was that compliant? The second part is if a full commuter car pulls up to Beaverton and all the max cars are already full, what happens then? And my third one was really at the nuts and bolts of this whole approach. And as the public, and including the, the public, the governing process relies on a review process before these are implemented, I believe the primary review process was, uh, was given to the Washington County Planning Commission who reviewed this proposal. Their conclusion was the Washington County Planning Commission that they rejected the commuter rail, concluding that it would not meet the needs of Washington County transportation uh, needs. How do you then translate that into strong community support? Sure. Uh, Colorado rail car uh, not is probably compliant, not ready to start service today. They've been working with the Federal Railroad Administration for I don't know how many years, and they have a, a punch list of things that need to be uh, addressed, but the one there was not. There no, that that one that is the one that the FRA has worked with Colorado Rail Car, and the fundamental challenge, which is the crashworthiness, you know, they got a big check mark. They're good there, uh, but there are a number of things uh, on a punch list. And if you're you know familiar with the so the building trades, you know that you're 99 and a half percent done, but you still have three pages of things that need to be fixed: uh, uh, door handle. Uh, and there are, because FRA is so precise on all the requirements, exactly where the handhold goes, uh, the doorknob, how much force you have to express, exert on the doorknob. So they still have a fair amount of work to do. But be it Colorado Railcar, Bombardier, Siemens, uh, Spanish or Japanese maker, whoever, before the TriMet and the FRA and actually ODOT has a role here too, their rail division, uh, can certify this for passenger use. All that has to be covered. But uh, Colorado rail car is a lap ahead of everybody else. Uh, Beaverton, what happens? I, I did mention that uh, we have, I think, the peak of the peak, we have trains, 125, 150 riders pulling into Beaverton. Two things uh, to think about. One is there's a possibility of extending the red line out to Beaverton Transit Center being looked at independent of this. Uh, that would certainly be one way to absorb some of that. But if you remember in the peak, uh, the, the uh, 
headways are down around, I don't want to say, four or five minutes apart. So there will be a chance to absorb that capacity. We understand we need to provide more capacity, and that's, that's the main thing. Last question. I, am, I don't live in Washington County. I seldom even cross to this side of the river, to tell you the truth. But I know that, the, that that had a lot to do with Washington County politics in terms of some road projects. Uh, and I know that the, the county commission and the planning commission had further discussions, and planning commission endorsed it. Uh, the community support, like I say, comes from uh, Wilsonville. I've been to the Wilson. I've been to each of these city councils, and uh, they're they're asking some hard questions. They're also very upbeat and very positive about it. So even at Wilsonville, right in the midst of their recall, uh, where things were a little dicey, uh, they really gave a, a strong endorsement to the project and talked about how they were looking forward to it. Um, do you anticipate that the new uh, makeup of the federal Congress will make it difficult to um, get the funding for the project, the federal side? Probably not the makeup itself, uh, but just the, just the dynamics. Like I said, we've got fewer resources. We have more competition. Uh, <clears throat> Oregon doesn't have a, you know, a delegation with a lot of super amount of horsepower. Uh, but certainly this project, Congressman Wu and Senator Smith are well aware of the project and are uh, watching it closely, I guess, and strong, strongly in favor. Uh, but right now, that's, we're really not in that environment yet. We're, we're just really talking turkey with uh, you know, ridership and costs. And Oh, uh, uh, capital costs, and I, I, I apologize. I just, I, phew, it's gone. Capital costs are probably half of this. It's, I'm remembering 60 to 70 million, and and likewise, ridership increase was about half. And I, I, I will, I write it down, but I will, uh, I'll get you the real story. I think that's the subject of the 500 level class. But just uh, briefly, <laughs> they, I mean, that, I mean, that really, I mean, I don't mean to be flipped. That is, I mean, those are, those are tough questions, deep, deep questions about how we account for public works in this country. I mean, not just, uh, and it's not just uh, TriMet and not just transit. For, rightly or wrongly, uh, the front end capital costs are not, you know, in their, the way we account for things, and not just TriMet, but across the country, uh, you know, you're well aware of this, that those front-end capital costs are not uh, accounted for in the, the, the kind of, it, aren't recovered on an annual basis, aren't, aren't accounted on an annual basis. Um, is that, a, is that a, a good policy or not? I'm not, you know, that's, that's the tough question. Uh, Uh, it rail where it, where it uh, has uh, uh, right of way over the road, stop the roads, and, and how much traffic congestion will it create as it's, if it does, 
as it goes through the neighborhoods. It, uh, it has uh, gated crossings that are out there right now. So if you go to Shoals or Hall or uh, Twelfth and Sherwood Road, the, the gates are there and they come down. When Portland and Western comes through with their freight trains, of uh, you know, I know they've got a rock train that goes through Tualatin at one point, quarter mile long, and backs up Twelfth and Sherwood Highway for Twelfth Sherwood Road a lot. Uh, these are two. They're just like uh, in terms of length. They're just like Max. Uh, they're traveling through. They're in and they're out. So yes, there is. Uh, there'll be. 32 more times that the gates go down and come up, but uh, and it's not a scientific survey, but we were watching when the Colorado rail car toured from Beaverton uh, down to Lake Oswego. Uh, it, it operated the signals like it was supposed to. Uh, it's, it's running at 30 miles an hour or more at some of these locations, and as uh, signals are down and up uh, in a matter of seconds. My concern is because I live in East County, you know, near the Max, as you know, because I've seen you at many meetings. Right, right. Um, uh, the worst congestion that we have out in East County is the Max train, you know, stopping 122nd, 102nd, and so on and so forth. And and sometimes on a 122nd, you'll have to wait three signals just to get past the Max train. And that that was my concern, especially at Christmas this, time. This case, it's, we got different, just a, a very different profile. The service is 30-minute headways, uh, peak hour. So like I say, you know, 30, 32 times a day, I think, if I'm, I'm notoriously bad at, at math. Maybe why I'm a planner, not an engineer. Uh, but so the, the frequency, as opposed to, you know, four or five minutes during peak hours, bi-direction, you know, both directions, and 10-minute uh, headway off-peak, uh, it's the number of, not even comparable in terms of number of trips. And the the... Through the environmental assessment process, they did look at, at all those. And you know, fortunately, you and I don't live out in this area. And uh, But as I travel out there, I realize I uh, see the existing level of congestion on Canyon and Shoals, uh, 12 and Sherwood Road. It's phenomenal. Uh, so I think we're, that's probably not much impact at all. Yeah, except I'm hoping something will cure not make it worse. Well, we, we hope we're part of that. Um, well, thank you. Um, I, well, I would just wanted to confirm. So, other than the five stations, no additional stops. It just keeps Correct. moving the whole time. And then, as far as these issues you're having with the feds, you say, I mean, it's with FTA Correct. about the modeling. What are the right. what are the issues there? Well, it's just a matter of going through. And this is a <clears throat> nationwide. They are for a whole bunch of different reasons, including the scrutiny, the, the competition, and because of just the, their desire to be more technically rigorous with these projects. They're looking more closely at everybody. They've got a new model that they've created uh, with something we call the Summit software uh, that basically comes, sits on top of Metro's model, reruns the Metro, or runs again, uh, the Metro model you know, with some parameters that they use, that the that FTA uses, because that's a, a kind of a lowest common denominator product that they've got to apply across the country. You put it onto a very advanced and sensitive model here. Metro's the guinea pigs, so they've been tearing their hair out trying to get the the ME2 model and the Summit software to talk to each other and actually put out something of consequence and. Again, there's then a part of it, I think, just from being in on one conversation, <clears throat> is the, this notion that it is kind of a hybrid project. So how, if by, just by analogy, well, if a 30-mile line going to Washington CBD carries 5,000, how can a 15-mile line going from suburb to suburb carry 4,000? So just starting out at a high level of sort of a, Head scratcher for some of the, the planning folks at FTA. So it's a matter of kind of going through everything from topography, mm -hmm. uh, the ability, you know, if you, you know, that area with the hills and the rivers, the inability to, to create that grid system, and then from a planning standpoint, a growth management standpoint, the unwillingness to invest in a uh, 
West Side Bypass, for instance. I mean, all those, all those play in. Yeah. Um, is there any potential and or consideration for adding one or two stops along the existing line? And is there also some talk about uh, an extension to Sherwood? Probably not much opportunity to add stops, uh, nor, is, nor is there much need. If you think of that corridor, there aren't. We've, we've caught the regional centers and town centers, Beaverton, Washington Square, Tiger Twilight, and Wilsonville, and there's probably not going to be a lot more along dense development, sort of mid in between those. Uh, the whole extension, uh, both to Yamhill County east west, Yamhill County to Milwaukee, because the Southern Pacific line crosses the Willamette between Oswego and Milwaukee. That's a, that's a tremendous potential, and uh, I've gotten calls from, I can't remember if it's Brooks or Kaiser, but one of the uh, Salem suburbs uh, getting all the information about this. Their uh, planning commission directed somebody to, to look at what it would take to extend this south to Salem, so that's tremendous potential in the future. I've been really involved in, in watching and, and attending hearings in the various cities from Wilsonville to Tigard and such. And when you talk about the support coming from these cities, uh, I'm, I'm very well uh, informed that they really, the, the support comes from the connection of the commuter rail to what's called smart growth in the urban centers is, that are being proposed at Washington Square and as well as Wilsonville and, 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 and as you well know, the rest of the region. You know, the newspapers I'm looking at are, are touting the commuter rail as uh, designed to ease congestion on I-5 and Highway 217, that businesses in Tigard and such in Wilsonville are hoping the train will also provide an economic boost to the downtown area, when, when really uh, I've seen no data whatsoever that will suggest any lessening of traffic on 217 or I-5, and I don't know where the idea that there will be an economic boost coming from commuter rail. So I would like you to address the connectivity between the urban villages, smart growth, and the need to have commuter rail stuck in the middle of every single one of them. Well, the, um, tough, tall order. And, uh, let, let, me, let me take a sort of stab at it and see how, how bad I mess up. Uh, you know, it's, it's about mobility. And not, you know, I don't think it's, it's necessarily mandated by, the, uh, by 2040 in the regional centers, but uh, certainly 2040 says let's have high connectivity between these centers. Makes you know, good business sense, good growth management sense, uh, and let's have options for folks. So uh, are we going to expand 217? Don't know, but let's have an option uh, to doing that. So I think it's just simply provides another route. I don't think it's the only way. I don't think commuter rail is ever going to take 60, 70, 80 percent of the, the mode share in that uh, corridor. Uh, economic boost, I, you know, I, I don't know what the, what the, how strong that's going to be, certainly in the early years. Uh, it depends on where things go with mobility. If uh, locational decisions you know, are begin to be made based on a mobility or lack thereof, then yes, uh, a location, an office location or a, a plant location close to this is going to be a plus for a, uh, a property owner. Well, my question was, I was trying to get it, to drag out of this some kind of justification in that if, if the public out there are believing that congestion will be reduced from the commuter rail and that business will be boosted and, and there really isn't a a, a reasonable expectation that either one of those are going to happen, isn't the support really kind of shallow and superficial? <laughs> well, but <laughs> and yes, I have stopped by beating my dog, honest. Uh, so we talked about the the development, and I think that that remains to be seen. I don't think that that's that's a reason to do or not do this. I think that's a bonus. In terms of traffic congestion, that's the you know that's that's certainly been. Uh, bandied about and, and uh, on every project that's been done in the region. And I, the, to me, it seems like, no, we can't reduce congestion as job growth, population growth, uh, number of people in the workforce all increase. You know, even if we have an increasing share of transit, congestion still increases. Now, I'm not sure. A couple years ago, I saw some data that said that maybe 
uh, VMT was beginning to level out, auto ownership level out. I don't, I'm not following that, and I mean, you all are much, much closer to the, the current thinking on that. Uh, but as, in terms of congestion, as long as uh, VMT auto ownership, employment, participation in the workforce grow, we're going to we're going to have. Um, earlier, you mentioned the capital costs all kind of lumped together in big figures. Do you have an idea what the soft costs are? Yes. Uh, to, I can tell you to the to the hundreds of thousands, but not the tens of thousands. Uh, we are, I think, we're looking at eleven and a half million, eleven eleven four, something like that. That includes design, so five million bucks for the all the design. Vehicle and all the track work and signals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it includes probably three million for des uh, agency designers, engineers, construction inspectors, project managers, accountants, uh, other things. That co insurance uh, for the for construction insurance. That, uh, and we're struggling with that. We have. Set that we have set the target very low on soft costs. That's far lower than we have seen on other big federal projects, and so we're trying to trying to push those down and, and put more money in the ground. We're actually because uh, we're like a minute from one thirty, and Rob has some announcements. Some a couple of quick announcements. Um, we'll give you a round of applause in just a moment. But I wanted to re remind everyone that the seminar archives are now on the main seminar page, so you can just click on the high bandwidth or low bandwidth uh, archive right next to the speaker's name. Uh, next term, on Tuesday afternoons, we're offering a travel demand forecasting course where you'll be using ME2, hands-on experience with ME2. So some of you, it sounds like, are interested in that. So come. we encourage you to uh, enroll in that course. And finally, our next seminar will be Friday, January 10th. Scott Rutherford from the University of Washington will be talking about, this is his title, Bus Rapid Transit, the New Mode of the Month. So look forward to seeing you next year, and uh, thank you very much. To thank you. If you don't need the room, I'm happy to stick around.